Hey guys, today I'm going to look at Perdita from The Winter's Tale. This one was requested by Ella May. Thank you very much, Ella May. Good on you if you're having a go at this monologue because it is a tricky one to do out of the context of the play. As per usual, I'm going to break down all the meanings in the monologue, but first I want to look at character interpretation and a couple of things that you can do to work through some of the challenges of the monologue. There are three things that are particularly tricky about this monologue. One of them is all the references in it. The second one is that it relies heavily on the connection to other people that she's speaking to. And the third one is that the whole point of the monologue is to really showcase Perdita's beauty and charm and loveliness. When that happens, often actors get a little bit carried away with the beauty of the language and they start to get a little bit vague, non-specific or unconnected character. So before I even start breaking down those meanings, I wanna talk about how you tackle those challenges. Firstly, all those Greek references. Oh my goodness, there are a lot of them. I mostly recommend don't panic about those. Shakespeare has put them there because he wants to showcase how intelligent and inspiring and beautiful and charming Perdita is. But it's not necessary for you to spell out to the audience what's going on with those references. The audience doesn't need to get it, but you just need to connect to what's underneath it. I'm going to break down what the meaning is and a bit of why it's there so you can start to make those choices. And beyond that, you don't need to worry too much about those references. Secondly, it's very important to have an idea of exactly who she's talking to and when and where they are. I always go on about eyeline. It's very, very important in this one. I would highly recommend that you practice this monologue maybe with a few you people if you can because each of the people that she's talking to she has a different relationship with she starts with talking to Camillo who she doesn't know very well and she's being playful but polite then she talks to Florizel who is courting her and she's being careful with him because he's above her in status so again that's a different type of relationship that you can play out in the subtext and then thirdly she talks to Mopsa and Dorcas some other shepherdesses who she'd be quite close with and then as well, if you want to choose, you can think of her talking to the whole group of people and kind of casting a spell over them with her loveliness. In your preparation, I highly recommend that you give some little bit of backstory to your relationship with those characters. It's really gonna help you get a little bit of detail. So let's jump into breaking down what she's actually talking about. She starts off in response to Camillo. Camillo has said to her, I should leave grazing where I of your flock and only live by gazing. So he's basically like, if I were one of your sheep, I wouldn't even eat anything. I would just look at you and would feed my soul. And she responds with, out, alas, you'd be so lean that blasts of January would blow you through and through. So firstly, out, alas, is not a Shakespeare-y, out, alas, kind of thing to say. She's being quite playful. She's saying, go oh, get on with you. You'd be so skinny that winds would just blow right through you. Next, she changes her focus to Florizel. So again, you want to just play on what's her body language with Florizel. How does it change from her body language with Camilla, who she doesn't know? And she says, now my fairest friend, which I think is already a little bit of a clue that she does actually quite like him. I would have had some flowers of the spring that might become your time of day. This is referring to something she's just been talking about before. So different types of flowers being suited to different people of different ages, basically, and different seasons of life and all that kind of thing. So again, we're calling back on the metaphor of Perdita being like the spring that warms everyone. She very quickly shifts into talking to Mopsa and Dorcas. And she says, and yours and yours, that where upon your virgin branches yet your maiden head's growing. Now, I think this is really great opportunity to use humor. This is what's gonna get you away from getting too serious with it or too like lovely and charming. She's being a little bit cheeky about it. She's like, you guys are so young. You guys haven't even experienced the world yet. Now we start to dig into these Greek references. So, oh Proserpina, for the flowers now that frighted thou that let's fall from Dis's wagon. Now, I think this again is a very playful reference. She, what she's talking about is some um, the goddess Persephone, also called Proserpina, I think in the Latin name. Um, was like abducted by Pluto, also called Dis. So he, when he abducted her, she was picking flowers and she was like, oh, I'm so scared, and she dropped her flowers. So she's sort of going, oh, I wish I had those flowers from that myth. But of course, it's not a big Shakespearean moment. I think, again, she's just being playful with it. And she's really playing the hostess role, which she does, she says before that my dad's asked me to be hostess, <laughs> basically. And she's kind of being welcoming and charming and going, oh, it's so nice to see you. And oh, I wish I had some flowers for you. Oh, wouldn't it be great? Do we have those beautiful flowers? I don't think she's taking this too seriously. She's playful, she's light, she's funny, and she's clever. 
Now, as she starts to talk about all the different types of flowers, what's going to be useful is thinking about who you're talking to and what kind of feeling she wants to create in them. So if you use that targeted kind of acting where you think about the impact that you wanna have on someone else, so I think what's useful is an objective of that you want everybody else around you to feel beautiful and loved and charming rather than trying to create a situation where you are being beautiful and loved and charming. So let's have a look at some examples. And with all of these, just connecting to like, who would she be talking to? When she says, daffodils that come before the swallow dares and take the winds of March with beauty, she's really trying to make the people around her get swept up in that beauty. So really connect just whoever you're talking to, talk to them about the daffodils and try and paint that picture for them. Try and get them to connect with the idea of collecting daffodils when you're a child. So imagining that she's talking to a childhood friend can be really helpful. And violets dim but sweeter than the lids of Juno's eyes. She's talking about how violets kind of like droop over but they're so sweet so like Maybe she's connecting with someone that's a little bit younger and sweeter. And then, or Cytherea's breath. Cytherea was Venus, so that's kind of calling upon that uh, excitement of love. If you're thinking about Venus's breath being like, ah, maybe she's talking to Florizel again, or maybe a shepherd and shepherdess that are in love. Pale primroses that die unmarried, ebb, they can behold bright Phoebus in his strength, that's the sun. So I'm actually not sure what die unmarried she's referring to there. I would have to guess that she's talking about flowers that have quite a short lifespan. So she's talking about how they kind of like live and die before they even see the sun kind of rise to its full strength. And then she says, a malady most incident to maid. So maybe there she's talking to one of the shepherdesses that doesn't have much luck with love, you know, and then that's something that she can connect with them about. Bold ox lips and the, and the crown imperial. Bold ox lips like stood up really, there were flowers that stood up really tall so and kind of stood out from the crowd. So maybe she's talking to like a really crazy looking shepherd, like really out there personality. And she says, and the crown imperial, then maybe it's someone that's a little bit more upright. Maybe she's talking to Polixenes there who's a little bit more upright because he's secretly a king. And lilies of all kinds, the flower de loose being one. So maybe she was referring then to all the beautiful shepherdesses that are there and just kind of making everyone feel included. So flower de loose is also fleur de, fleur de lis is the particular translation of that. And maybe it's a particularly beautiful or young or French shepherdess. So all throughout there, you can make your own choices about who you think she's speaking to. Just pick someone that you think is gonna bring something out in you, a particular emotion, a particular connection, so it feels specific and it's not just naming a bunch of flowers. And then to finish with, oh, these I lack to make you garlands of, and my sweet friend to strew him o'er and o'er. I think that end section really kind of brings everybody together, that sense of we're all celebrating together. She really makes people feel warm and loved and welcome. And that's it. I hope that gives you some help. Gosh, this is a challenging one. So please let me know if you have any questions. Oh my goodness, good luck with that. Let me know how you go and I will see you next time.